you so much for being here this morning. My name is Hannah Petey, and I'm the Assistant Director for Career and Professional Development in the School of Data Science. And I'm going to be moderating the panel this morning. We have some wonderful women here, and I'm so excited to hear about their career paths and um, all the wonderful things they have to share with us today. I hope that you all enjoyed the keynote this morning as much as I did, and we're just gonna jump right in to some questions. Um, there'll be some time at the end for questions from the audience, and some of the panelists will actually be at the mentor roundtables if you have additional questions later. Um, so just to get started, can you all just tell us a little bit more about yourselves? Sure, um, I'm Amanda Mercier. Uh, I actually grew up on a farm in Orange County, Virginia, so I know Charlottesville pretty well. Um, most of my uh, career and college decisions were based on how to stay close to home. Um, <laughs> so they were geographic, but it ended up being really interesting. So um, I have an undergrad and master's in mathematics. Um, I spent most of my career working in government service and more recently at Microsoft, leading a team of data scientists and software engineers focused on DOD and IC problems. Okay, uh, I'm May Casterline. Um, I would like to say there was a grand plan to all of my career cho choices, but there was not. Uh, I actually started out wanting to be a photographer and somehow I'm in charge of NVIDIA's technical business in the defense space now. So it's been a weird meandering path. Um, but my love of photography brought me to imaging science. Um, I went to school up in Rochester, New York. Uh, and imaging science was an interesting discipline that merged sort of imaging technology, so physics, computer science, um, and engineering all into one. Uh, and so I fell in love with remote sensing, so satellite airborne imaging platforms, the processing architectures behind the data those systems uh, produce. Um, and so I had to learn how to code and analyze data to do that job. Um, and so I stayed on and did a PhD in, in remote sensing at RIT, and that led me to defense as well. Um, and then uh, worked locally for a bit at CCRI, uh, learned a lot there, learned a ton there, um, and then made the jump to NVIDIA about six years ago. And so now I run a team of engineers that manage uh, all of the technical business with systems integrators in the defense space. So those are like the big guys like Lockheed and Boeing's of the world. Um, so, I manage teams of engineers as well as advise on autonomy and AI projects for the defense space. Um, and so, yeah, that's me. Hi, everyone. I'm Yeri Kumala, and I'm an analytics engineer at CPEAK. Um, my, similar to me, was a winding road. <laughs> I started in public health. I have my master's in public health and work for local and state government, nonprofits, uh, using data really to inform policy, programs, different initiatives, and wanted to shift our, um, how I think about data, because in the healthcare space and the public health space, uh, the way you think about data can be very rigid and very slow moving, and the tools and approaches were moving so quickly in the tech industry um, that I was curious. I'm a problem solver at heart, so I, got familiar with R because I had a biostats foundation which helped from grad school and delved into the world of marketing. And then it was the startup world, different types of startups like GovTech and HealthTech and now I'm at SeatGeek and I work as an analytics engineer which wasn't really a big title when I started um, in the data science world and it has been the perfect bridge of data engineering and analytics. So really being able to think about the, the business need and the way they think about problems and shaping and building and transforming data in a way that's usable um, and answers the question all the way from the data engineering end. So it's been pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, all right, my name is Carrie Guerrero and I went to school and when I went to school I couldn't choose between studying physics or economics so I just chose math because I felt like I could go either direction. And back when I was in college, I had these like grand ideas that I'd end up being a spy. So I enlisted in the United States military 
in order to get that experience. And I came out of the Marine Corps five years later, and I was like, well, I'm not gonna be a spy. I'm married and I have children now. Uh, but I did have like government experience and a math degree, and a lot of experience working in geospatial intelligence. So navigating to data science in the Department of Defense world made a lot of sense. So I also worked for CCRI for a little while, phenomenal company. Uh, and I've been, since then, I guess, bobbing back and forth between individual contributor roles and management roles. And I find myself now at Capital One, where I'm a distinguished machine learning engineer. It's my first role that hasn't carried the data science title with it. And it basically means I'm doing still individual contributor work, but I'm doing it in a way that I also get to like come to the big leadership meetings and help make the strategic decisions. So we'll see if I don't wander myself back over to management eventually, but individual contributing is where I find myself now. Awesome, well thank you all so much for sharing that so far. Um, so the next question that I have for you is thinking a little bit about your career journey up to this point, and I know a lot of you have shared about that already, um, but thinking about how have you navigated to your first role in the data science field or um, maybe thinking about a pivotal moment for you so far in your career that has really helped you kind of jumpstart into the field. I can jump in. Um, so for me, making the transition from public health world uh, to this idea of being a data scientist and how it was defined um, required me speaking the language. And so if it was more trying to translate the concept that I had uh, vague understandings of into this way that they talk about it in different industries. And so I'm a reader by nature. And so it was like looking online and finding some books, but and trying to see how I could translate my current work into this new approach. Like I really wanted to build predictive models. I really wanted to think about data differently, but the terms that we use in my space were different. I had been a social epidem epidemiologist at one point, and so I was just like, all right, social epi like uses a lot of data in many different ways. And so how do I think about that? Um, and that shift helped me understand that I was a lot more ready than I gave myself credit initially, and more willing to take the, the, the risk, I guess, or just jump in and start applying to different opportunities with this new framing. So it was like translating. I had to just like focus on translating what I knew into this new language. And then it gave me my first opportunity. Uh, so the, the irony is the first job I applied to that was for data scientists, the first sentence on my cover letter was, I am not a data scientist, I am an image scientist, but I feel like these are mechanically the same job. Uh, I work with boatloads of data, I have to figure out mathematical techniques to find insight, like I feel like these are the same skills. I never, I don't have a degree in data science, it didn't exist when I was going to school, and I think anybody that's probably, like it didn't really exist. So there's a lot of more classical, I guess, education tracks that found their way into data science. Um, and even when I was hiring, I, I didn't explicitly look for data science. So you guys kind of have a bit of a jump, because like, we had to learn on the job sort of thing. Um, so and I still think of myself as an image scientist. Um, it's, it's just I use data science techniques to extract information from that domain. I think for me, I had a mentor that <clears throat> saw something in me I didn't see in myself. Um, actually, it wasn't a woman. It was uh, a very kind gentleman at my first job. And um, we were having a conversation. I was just kind of bored at that job. You know, I, It was a lovely job. It was a great entree into the professional world, but I was ready for something different, you know? And he just started throwing out ideas. Oh, what about, um, you could work for FBI. You could work for NSA. You could work for CIA. You could, and he started, it just, things that had never occurred to me were within my reach. And I think that opened up a huge world for me that I don't even know that this man understands the impact that had on my life. 
right? Similar conversations, fast forward, you know, when I'm thinking about applying to Microsoft, what, I just thought some of these companies were outside my reach. Like, I'm just a little country girl from middle of nowhere. <laughs> just, um, so sometimes, and you know, this is an encouragement both because I receive that advice, but then also for us to understand the huge impact that we have on one another. When you see something in someone, don't underestimate the power of telling them that because they might not realize it. Even if it's like everybody you ask is like, well, obviously they're awesome at that. That's their superpower, but tell them. Um, you will not understand, A, how much it means, and B, it might completely change the, tra the trajectory of their life in a really good way. Yeah, so my, my first role was after the Marine Corps, and I came into my position, and I had like good math background and zero computer science background. Like really legitimately no clue what I was doing. So the first months were like, trial by fire for me and it can be so overwhelming and I remember this one minute when one of the other engineers where I was working came into my office and he was one of the ones who's like amazing computer scientist you watch and you're like man this person if I could know half of what they knew and he came in and he was like whoa I'm so stuck today isn't it amazing we get to come in and like figure stuff out we don't know every day I love my job and I don't think he even knew like how much of an impact that had on me. But every time I would walk into a project or a room and I was like, yep, don't know what I'm doing. I was like, but it's fine. Isn't it amazing that this is our job just to like be curious, stay courageous and try to figure it out. So that like, I think in my beginning had a huge impact on me. And it's still a thing I say to myself all the time. Wow, aren't I lucky I get to figure things out for my job? Excellent. Awesome. Well, I loved um, all of your answers, and specifically, Carrie and Amanda, those kind of tie directly into my next question, which is all about mentorship, networking, and how those have supported your career. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about the importance of networking and mentorship, and then maybe a little bit about how you've maybe implemented strategies or different techniques to help those support you throughout your career so far. I can start. <laughs> uh, so the, the networking thing, I don't know if this is true for like what percentage of the room, but I personally dread down to my core going to networking events, like <laughs> all the way down to the core of me. Uh, and I do it and I see people who like excel at it and I just worship the ground they walk on and want to be like them. But coming to events like this doesn't always work super well for me. I'm deeply introverted. So one of the techniques that I have found, because like, your network is so important. It will drive your future jobs. It will drive helping you when you're in a job and you're like, is it just me? Is this crazy? Is something weird happening? You have a network that you can go back to and reflect on. So one of the ways that I've worked really hard to build my network is just the people that I find myself sitting with at any given moment, the ones that I'm working with, I make really sure that I stay in contact with them on a consistent basis after we've kind of gone our separate ways. Because the introduction to strangers thing freaks me out every time. But if I know you were in my class and you were amazing, so I'm gonna set a timer. And every time at Christmas time, we're gonna go get coffee together so I don't lose track. And over the years, like you build out this network, this network of people that you have really worked with and you really trust and you really know well, and then everyone that they know kind of clicks into your network too. So like, don't be afraid to just schedule continual checkups with the people that you're in school with now or the teachers that you really like now and just Put them on your calendar. I have quarterly lunches with some of the ladies I've talk, worked with before because I, I don't want to lose track of them. That's awesome. Yeah, I do a Christmas card list. So every yes. year, <laughs> so. you know, I have, and, and a lot of times people just send a Christmas card and put it, slap an address on it, put a stamp on it, it's done. But I like handwrite little notes. And 
to, you, to your point, like reflecting on those very deeply personal relationships, a lot of the network is beyond that cursory meeting or just acquaintance level. Your real true network are the people that have been in the trench, trenches with you, people that have witnessed you when things got tough. And you will be surprised, A, how fast that network grows if you're open to it, mm -hmm. um, and B, how, how long it can stay with you. I, ha I had a birthday, and I had my Facebook love or hate social media. This was the coolest moment. I, my college professor, my math professor wished me happy birthday. My sixth grade teacher wished me happy <laughs> birthday. And I was just like, how cool is it that I can stay in touch with these both incredible women um, and that we care about each other. Like, I'm not real old, but I'm old enough for sixth grade to be a long time ago. So <laughs> that, A, she remembered me and took the time to just say happy birthday. So those really minor touch points, I would definitely echo that. I think they're really important. And building off of that, uh, we now live in a time where there are a lot of data communities. Um, so when I started, this idea of networking, especially when you're coming from a different sector, or like um, finding mentors just felt very hard, because I didn't know where to start. And um, there were a lot of boot camps that were emerging, and all this stuff, and I was like, I don't want to do any of that. I'm still trying to figure things out. Um, so my approach was when I'm online, however that looks like. It could be an article, it could be this talk that I came across. If there's something that really resonated with me, I would reach out to those individuals. You would be surprised how many will respond. And it could be a 30-minute conversation, and my question was always just like, what was your journey to data? Like, um, just personally interested in like, how people made their way into that space. And for me now, I'm like really invested in building data communities. So I'm part of a lot of Slack communities for those who are on Slack. And I have a long list if you want to know. Um, there's like locally optimistic, there's the DBT Slack, there's operational analytics. I can just go on and on. But the beauty about that is that you don't have to be active. You just can sit back and absorb a lot of information. And there'll be one or two people that will start saying things where you're like, oh, I really wanted to learn that, or that really resonates, or I love how they framed it, or this is something I wanted to explore, and you reach out. The whole point of those spaces is being able to um, start conversations, and that way I've been able to create many communities within those spaces of like analytics engineers or like people interested in XYZ. And it's um, been a nice way to do it in a way that feels a little more natural to how I operate. Um, and it's also convenient, uh, but it's and the idea of being intentional and carving out time for coffee or like that's I think is really important if you want to bu build deeper relationships with certain folks. Um, but yeah, there's a lot out there. Uh, so I, I share a little bit of what Carrie was saying. Network, when something's labeled networking, kind of feels like people are saying the quiet part out loud. It's like everybody's here to advance some agenda, personal or otherwise, and it's like, is it really going to be genuine? I don't know. So I've always found the most effective way to form useful, quote unquote, networks is through intellectual honesty. The folks that I've had uh, really meaningful discussions about technical work that's either failing or a really clear opportunity that's maybe not so clear to everybody and we're digging into a problem, those conversations uh, lead to really meaningful connections that are sort of born out of intellectual respect and those become effective. Uh, and so I usually spend more time there. Uh, you, it's, you can't make it happen, though. You just have to recognize when they're happening and then grab it and know that that's, that's a great person to get to know and have you know, in your sort of quote-unquote network. So that's kind of how I, I've always looked at networking. 
Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for sharing those. As a career advisor, um, I'm very passionate about supporting people in networking and building long-term long mentorship. So I really appreciate all of those tips um, and advice for everybody here. And another thing that I'm also passionate about is people advocating for themselves. So the next question is thinking about um, kind of how important do you all see um, women in data science advocating for themselves as far as salary, compensation, um, even maybe title? And then what advice do you have for those who may be hesitant to negotiate or feel really uncomfortable approaching that process? I can start as someone who's deeply uncomfortable <laughs> with that. And then the others can go. Hopefully they do better. Um, so this is a space where I feel like you have to be very informed. You have to know what's going on, right? And uh, if, you, if you get an offer, especially at the beginning of your career, you're just happy to get something. Yet, the advice and the reality is that you're supposed to start that process of like negotiating and advocating for yourself as early on as possible, and that HR professionals expect that. But if you don't, uh, if you have never practiced how to do that, you don't know, uh, you're, you, there's that fear of losing what was offered, and you hear horror stories out there as well, but also understanding your value and trying to figure out like, how do I assess that when I know nothing, right? Or I'm entering a new field, or this is a higher title. Um, so my advice, like what I've been doing is um, research, but also, asking that question to people within my space. How much do you make? It's very uncomfortable, but it's a very good exercise. It's a very good conversation with the people you trust, right? It's like, did you negotiate? And if you did, what did you do? There's always that one friend who has all the resources. And like, she gave me like scripts and how much you should, how you push and how you have the conversation. I was like, how did you? And it's like five of us having that conversation. And I tried it. And she said, when you're really uncomfortable, it means you're doing it right. <laughs> and uh, I can tell you, I did it and I chickened out like halfway through her list of like <laughs> things to do. But I did the first half, which was like, keep practicing. So it's not something that comes natural to most, I think, but it's, it's more like you have to equip yourself before you even get there and start practicing before you even get to those conversations. So for me, and I've been in many different data roles, in many different spaces, it's been this slow progression of getting more and more comfortable with that practice. I mean, the beautiful thing is we're here for data science, right? So just make it smaller by making it something that you are comfortable with. Make it a data science problem. Mm -hmm. So to your point, take surveys, <laughs> <laughs> uh, both for techniques and then also for the actual numbers. Um, I think also just adding numbers to your resume or to the reason, like, um, in intelligence, the way that they write finished intelligence is really strong. You state something, and then you give bullet points that support that statement. So if you approach this argument in the exact same way, I deserve at least this mm -hmm. X amount, and these are the reasons why. Because I was 90% something, mm -hmm. something. I, you know, and just start putting numbers to it, and all of a sudden, now you're in your zone again. So just reclaim that territory as, this is a data conversation. This is not a me being greedy conversation. Mm -hmm. This is a conversation about data, supply and demand. That's what we're discussing here. And believe in yourself, right? That's right, yeah. Because <laughs> you do all of that and you're like, this is why you have to like build your confidence and practice yeah. it because you, sometimes you hesitate and you're like, right, and you're like, I did this, but you know, and, but that's, that's true. The, you have to do it with confidence, some level of confidence. Yeah, that's all. Sounds totally like it echoes what my experiences have been. And it's always crazy because I look back at my resume and I look back at things that I put on it like 10 years ago. And I remember putting them on my resume and at the time thinking, do I even like, is this even true? And now I'm looking back at it and I'm like, oh, I undersold myself a lot. So don't be afraid to like put it out there for what it really is. I think the flip side of this is like inside of your job also being able to advocate what it is that you want around your career development, even within your internal company. 
because I'll see that happen too, where you're like, oh, I really want to like run the design of our next big project, or I really want to be like the tech lead on this new model that's going out. And I, I do see it happen where, especially to women, we look at our department and we say, okay, there's like 10 things that have to happen or everything's gonna fail. I'm gonna take care of those 10 things. But those are not usually the things that get you recognized or promoted. So really be like super intentional with your time and don't be afraid to like advocate for the big projects that you want that will get you the promotion and get you the big raise instead of seeing all the pieces of slack and just reaching out to sort of help move it forward. Like, be a good team player, help out, but be really aware of how much of your time that can creep into, because it, it doesn't usually translate to raises. <laughs> uh, I think it's something that comes with time. When you first start out, like Yuri said, you're just excited to get a job, especially after being in grad school, making no money. It's exciting to get a paycheck. And then at some point, I don't know, I mean, I, I remember when my, I just a switch flipped and I was chasing a job. They were kind of chasing me. And uh, I was just decided, I'm gonna ask for what to me seemed like an insane number. And I was like, what do I have to lose? Worst case scenario is I keep my current job. Best case scenario is they give me a lot more money. And uh, it worked. I was terrified. I was like having the conversation, trying to stay cool, I asked for this big old number, and um, and they met it. And then I, I don't think I've ever been more ecstatic when they met that number. I couldn't believe it worked. That gave me a lot of confidence going into negotiations. So sometimes, I guess you just, you're scared, but you got to take the risk. I mean, worst case, you still have the job making the money you're living on now. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much. That was great advice. Um, we're going to go ahead and open it up to audience questions right now. You all had wonderful questions and thoughts during the keynote. Um, so I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to get all of your questions in. Just as a reminder, questions end with question marks. So please feel free to share your thoughts, but try to make sure that you include a, a question for the panelists. Um, I also want to remind you to try to keep it career focused. Um, but yeah, anybody who, who has questions, feel free to put your hand up and uh, Mike will come over to you. Oh, can I have one go back on the compensation? One thing to check for is how they actually break down compensation. It's not just salary, uh, particularly in tech firms, right? Yeah. There's uh, stock compensation. Ask for signing bonuses. Ask for retention bonuses. The worst thing they will say is no. And then you didn't have it to begin with, so it's not like you lost anything. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Plus one. <laughs> I am so excited that all of you are telling me about how you were going from one thing and into another. I'm currently career switching um, for the fourth time. <laughs> and I was afraid I was going to come here and only hear from people who have done it from day one. That's the only thing that they know how to do. So I'm, thank you. Networking, hardest thing possible. I feel like at my age, getting into the internet and going on to LinkedIn and trying to figure out who to connect to is extremely difficult, especially since I am an introvert. And I'm wondering if there are any contacts, any suggestions of um, groups I could possibly join that would make for a better and easier segue into that. Does anybody have any suggestions? Do you have a, do you have a specialization that you're interested in? Um, I've just gotten my data analysis certificates. Um, I've just finished teaching math for seven years. Um, I'm finishing up an engineering degree. I have a degree in art. 
everything's open. <laughs> I am willing to do anything, and I would really like a lot of money doing it. <laughs> Get it. The local tech scene here is really, I found, welcoming, and, and Carrie's kickstarting the um, Python, the data science yep. meetup group again. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, uh, so the local events around tech, I find very open and um, enjoyable when I can find time to go to them. There's also a Slack community um, that's largely populated by the tech community. Um, but probably maybe starting, you know, just local practicing, like having those technical interest conversations with people you get to know locally, I, I, I find it useful. It's, um, cause then it's, they're part of your community, maybe part of another part of the Charlottesville scene that has nothing to do with tech, right? And then you have something to relate on and you can kickstart it there. Um, but Carrie's data science group, I'm gonna plug it. Okay, I'll plug it myself. Yeah, Reggie and I are trying to, we, we are re-standing up the Charlottesville data science meetup group, which is a great opportunity to either A, just come, and hang out with other data scientists, right? You can find us on Meetup, join. We're going to start bringing some new events and speakers in. Or B, if there's the thing that you really love or you really want to learn about or you've been like itching to understand better, reach out to me and say, hey, in two months, I'd love to give a little short talk about this new Python library I want to learn about. Because legitimately, the best way to learn something is to commit to talking about it, because then you'll definitely <laughs> learn it. So, so reach out, go to the meetup, join it. It's way easier, because then you're, you're, you're networking around like the technical thing. You're not networking around something that is more nebulous and way more frightening. And the other piece of advice I would give is like, uh, I will affirm like start small, but the other one is identify one area that you're really interested in, because data is so vast, yeah. and look for an example of a community in that space. And all it takes is a quick search, I guarantee something will come up. And start really small, like if it's a podcast, if it's a Slack channel, if it's like a meetup that's in the specialty you're looking into, and then see who like, like who you would want to talk to, and then start this idea of like, could I do a coffee chat? you know, or whatever you want to call it. But like, see if you would be comfortable practicing just reaching out to one individual just to learn about what they do. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that there are some other great questions out there, so please feel free to raise your hands and a mic will come to you. Ron, Reggie. Reggie's getting his workout in today. <laughs> it kind of sounds better. I can without hear you. <laughs> Less echo. Yeah. Hello? Okay. Hi. I was wondering what your advice or experience might be in introducing data science to a field that hasn't necessarily approached it yet. So to the lady across the room, I too, I love art and museum work and the AI field, it's generative with images especially, not only in studying the mathematics behind specific artists, but also cultivating its own form of artwork. And I think museums and the kind of nonprofit world has been last to be introduced to this new field of data science. And so what would your advice be in introducing or approaching that industry with these kind of new opportunities? Have passion. Mm -hmm. I, this, the, this was like kind of my specialty in DOD and IC. I was always in these pockets where they just and I was We're going to go that way. I was just going to say, have you met the department? Right. right. <laughs> right. Uh, lots of these places where they absolutely had data, like ungodly amounts of data, and they just ignored it because that's the way they had always done business. It's a really bad excuse. Um, but I came in, uh, I can remember one in particular, um, I was doing strategic communications for them, and 
I just was like crazy passionate about. I was so interested. I would wake up at five in the morning and I was just like, oh my God, I can't wait to go to work. And these people were like, what is wrong with this woman? I, and I'm like, you know, eating lunch at my desk, like headphones on, like, yeah, yeah, nice. I can't talk to you right now. And you know, just like mad scientists going crazy. But at the end of it, um, I managed, it was the first time in my career I managed to see the full feedback loop of, I saw something interesting in the data which by the way, if it's true, might be so obvious that people want to discount it. Because it's like, it's like people on Shark Tank, like, I could have thought of that. Yeah, but you didn't. So, <laughs> um, so I saw a trend in the data. I, um, I capitalized on it. I suggested actions that we could take. And we took those actions and we saw positive repercussions in the data because of that. And then they were like, whoa. And I was like, right? <sighs> Like, mouth breathing at them. <laughs> you take a break. But, I mean, if you just bring that crazy passion, um, and A, that'll help you ride the speed bumps when people don't get it or don't care, because there was a months and months and months where no one cared, just me. But I cared so much that I didn't care that they didn't. Um, so bring the passion to it, and uh, don't be afraid to be wrong because I was wrong a couple times before I hit that one that I was like, whoa, this is it. Um, so you, you'll get there if, if you just have the passion, I think. Yeah, and I, was, I, I like that. Like there's the passion piece and there's also, well that's all public health really. You're always convincing somebody. But um, one thing that I did in one of my jobs where I wanted them to really leverage all the data that they had, I worked at a homeless shelter, day shelter, and they had all this data, they had no capacity to use it. And you're just like, oh my gosh, we could make it. And so what I did was a lot of shadowing of like trying to understand the pain points, like how, be, uh, how data is created and generated, right? Like from the input all the way to like how decisions are made and proposed an, an idea similar to like, like we could improve our intake if you better understood the kind of needs that were coming in and how you should like Shuffle, you know, shuffle resources. And they were like, yeah, but how, right? And I was like, well, that's where I come in. And so I spent quite some time like having to clean extremely messy data, but then I was able to like tell their story better, which they needed for grant funding anyway, but also improve the whole intake flow. And it was such a small thing, right? It was like consistency, being able to have a snapshot at the end of every week see where you're wasting time, and then it just changed um, their whole flow in the morning especially, and they carved out resources for a position, for like someone just solely focused on like processing and generating insights from their data. And this was a very small like day shelter in Denver at the time, and I just remember Oh, this is why I want to do data science, right? Like, uh, this is what I. This is why I do what I do. But it's this idea of like you have to give them something that they can, that's tangible to them, right? And you have to make it real because a lot of people are collecting stuff and just are not doing anything with it across all spaces. Um, so yeah, agreed. Plus one, and then <laughs> there's this really cheesy thing that our CEO always says, but it's starting to like sink in with me a little bit. Reluctantly, uh, he he always says we're here to delight our customers, and I was like, that's the cheesiest line. But if you think about it a little bit, if you delight somebody with a solution, then you're making room for like a really good form of inspiration. It, you can have inspiration from frustration and anger, like you're just so mad that makes you do something. But if you delight them, then they're really open. And so showing, both of these, Yeri and Amanda had examples of demonstrating, solving a pain point. But if you do that with delight, and they're, they get a really good form of inspiration that they're more willing to execute on. So knowing the pain points and um, showing them by example how this solution solves something that was previously un unsolvable generally leads to some form of delight which then gets motivation. Yeah, and just, if you are embedded in a place that doesn't do data science, 
you were like uniquely suited to find the actual place that could benefit from beta, data science in a way that someone that isn't as like passionate or invested or entrenched in the day-to-day -day of like how the data is happening would ever be able to even notice. So you're in a good place if you're sitting somewhere deeply in wherever it is that has the problem. Okay, go ahead. I got the mic. <laughs> All right, thank you so much uh, for putting this together. Uh, just want to, um, I can't thank enough. Um, I see here all these experts are well established in your field. And on the other hand, when I'm looking at the LinkedIn job descriptions, uh, it's kind of conflicting when I see the entry level jobs put out there with a requirement of two or four years of experience. How reasonable do you think that is? And how, do you, how would you suggest the new aspiring data scientist to uh, really tackle this kind of uh, conflict or whatever struggles they're having? Um, I mean, people like me would be very confident uh, with their skill set and say, OK, I'm going to apply to the senior level position even though I feel that I don't have that kind of, or that level of expertise. But not every individual will think that way, and they will always be hesitant to go that route. So I think if you can put some kind of light on how to really deal with those kind of job descriptions, it would be really empowering to all these individuals here. It's a great question. I just had a very long conversation about job descriptions last week. Um, because uh, at my current job, you know, we're hiring, and um, I think the market is really tough. I'm just going to be very real. I think a lot of companies are looking for unicorns, and they can because there's so many people um, looking for the roles that are in the data science realm. And this is where I'm just going to say it, networking matters. Um, this is where you should know what you're capable of, even if you don't meet like that crazy year, you know, five years entry level, you're like, what? Or my favorite, one of the tools that we use in analytics engineering, that's big now in analytics engineering, it's called DBT, and it's only been alive for like, I don't know, less than 10 years or something like that. And one of the job descriptions said something like 12 years experience. It was hilarious. You're just like, there's nobody. <laughs> Who's been using DBT for that long? But, so what I'm trying to say is, your in is building that network. You need, what I learned much later in my career, and I wish I learned a little earlier, is that um, it is extremely helpful to have people who can send you references, or speak, uh, or tell you what's real and what's not within a company, or give you real insights of what they're looking for. So I'm gonna use my role. Analytics engineering means very different things in different places, because we can flex from data engineering to analytics, right? And my company like puts this general description, but what we're looking for is a data engineer, right? So you look at the description and you apply, and you don't have a shot. But if you spoke to me, I can tell you, well, Unless you ramp up on this and frame your resume specifically to this, you know, it's not really going to be looked at. And that's the hardest part about the job search and sifting through it. It's getting people to paint a real picture of what they're looking for. They'll list 12 requirements, but they only need five. So you need to know what those five are. And it's like, how do you figure that out? There are some ways that you can do on your own, but it's much harder. So it's more talking to people and um, doing those uncomfortable pieces of the job search is my advice anyway. I don't have like a good answer because the truth is it can be really, really terrible. You know, like, well, I applied for this generic job. Mm -hmm. I got denied for these six very specific reasons which were never told to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know how to iterate and do better on the next time I apply to a similar position. Like, it's actually terrible. I feel like the way that we do job applications and then feedback to applicants is, like, awful. It doesn't serve any of us at any time. The one thing, though, is, like, don't be afraid to count 
data science experience for these entry roles, even if you haven't had a data science title, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. I have some experience because I did this sort of data work within the company or the role that I was in before. And use it to feel like you're filling in any time requirements that, like you're a teacher. You've worked with data. You've communicated about math and data to people. That's a huge part of the job. Mm -hmm. And just like, don't be discouraged if you put however many applications out there and nobody's getting back to you. The system is like kind of terrible. So don't take it as like, oh, my personal reflection on me is that I must not be able to do this. That is 100% not true. Just like keep putting them out there and eventually you'll make those connections you need to. Uh, well, I don't know if I have an answer. Well, one way I usually approach, I've had, I've read a lot of resumes Right, people, when I'm on hiring panels or whatever. And um, you have to realize the person, as much as you don't want to think this is what's happening, they get a pile of resumes, I gotta read them quick, and I gotta decide who do I wanna screen. And then there's like a yes, no pile. And um, you wanna be respectful and give everybody a fair shot, but you have to make a decision. You don't have limitless time. So the best resumes that I read are usually ones that um, they've maybe done a little bit of pre-work. They understand the job and like the problem space that we're working in and they've taken their experience and it's not just a massive CV of like a thousand things you did. It's a, this is how what I did applies to what you're looking for. Even if they're, ex I've never really been that hung up on experience and degrees and stuff. Like if you can show, if you can demonstrate to me that you've solved this type of problem, you have a critical thinking ability, you can teach yourself things to an extent, you know, the, the biggest thing that's hard to find is people that know when to ask for help and when not to ask for help. That's like a magical lane where you're willing to try up to a point but then you realize when you're spinning wheels and not getting somewhere. So like highlighting things like that, I look for stuff like that. So it's more like knowing what they're looking for and, and highlighting what your experience uh, brings to the table to tackle those problems. That's like the best thing you can do because you're going through you know, a fast, some of these are automated and like Carrie, that's the terrible part. Like you're just, you're not gonna get through it and unless you know somebody like, like Gary says, but like, when you do get to a human, that's, that's what I was always filtering on. Yeah. Uh, I hired a lot um, <clears throat> in my current role at Microsoft and before when I worked for the government. And a lot of folks know, hey, I'm looking for a unicorn. I'm very unlikely to find all these skills. Um, it's much easier to take a position and downgrade it, like a senior role, and make it a more intro role, um, especially if they've had it posted for a while, if you've seen it persist for months and months, apply again, like, what do you have to lose? So um, I would say it's much easier to downgrade it to an intro role than to go the opposite way, at least in industry. Um, and, and the other advice I would give is, you can take a sidestep too, right? Like if, if this is the company for you, just get your foot in the door. Maybe you're not coming in in the exact role that you want, but if you can frame your skills and experience to get you a different, maybe not your favorite role, once you get in the door, there's a lot more opportunities for you. The other thing I like to do, I usually bend skills into threes. So in my role, I usually, a unicorn, I know my idea of a unicorn, my idea of a unicorn is somebody that sort of understands the defense space, which is a very complex, sentient being all on its own. Um, somebody who knows AI, data science, you know, techniques, experience, whatnot. Somebody who knows software and hardware engineering. Those are the skills I need for my team to be really successful. I, I put out descriptions for all th with all three listed. I'm looking for you to hit two. I assume I can teach one. I cannot teach two simultaneously in time to get you to up level and be able to do the job. So if I find somebody with two, they're reasonable to keep moving with. 
Three's the unicorn, but I'll take two and teach one. And I think we'll have time for one more audience question. Do we already? <laughs> Run. <laughs> Hi, thank you all so much for coming to speak today. Um, it sounds like you all have a lot of experience in what are traditionally male-dominated spaces and male-dominated fields, data science, intelligence, defense, that kind of thing. What advice would you give to someone at the beginning of their career looking to step into those spaces and continue to own their identity in those spaces? Someone's opinion of you does not define you. And actually, someone's opinion of you is none of your business. It's probably better that way. Um, I've had a lot of people ass assess me and assert things about me that were very wrong. Um, and I think when I reflect on moments, like those pivotal moments when it was truly some either gender things or maybe it's just age things, like they look at you and they go, oh my god, you're so young, you couldn't possibly, you know, it could be any combination of those things. The pivotal moments when I felt like, ah. Oh, I did that well. I handled it with humor, typically. I was able to just kind of let it roll off my back. I remember um, when I worked for the Navy, I stood up and I'm like, straight out of college, I'm not only a woman in a male-dominated industry, but I'm also a civilian in a military world. And, and that just like compounded it, and I'm young, I'm straight, it's obvious I'm straight out of college. And I was standing up there giving a briefing to this captain, and everybody knew he was a jerk. There was no secrets, but right, I'm, sta I'm already standing up and everybody's looking and he's supposed to intro me. And this guy goes on some tirade, like five, 10 minutes while I'm standing there. And he's like, you know, Dahlgren's not positioned to do this analysis. They're not even war fighters. It's just a bunch of civilians and blah, blah, blah. Like just on and on and on about how basically I shouldn't be here. So when he was done, he was like, anyway, here's Amanda, she's gonna tell you. He looked at me and I went, or I could sit down. I mean, I really don't have to. <laughs> and everyone just like laughed and it immediately released the tension. And I'm like super proud of that moment because I was so young and I actually, it's funny, you had like art and other things here. I was a theater major at first. I wanted to be on Broadway. So my ability to take those, what at the time felt like, felt like wasted moments in improv, like, oh, it's just an improv class. That was improv at work, like my ability to turn it on a dime. And so I think if you just find a couple moments, you will learn from them and you will be able to repeat them. Um, another really pivotal moment for me was um, I had a very obvious gender issue more recently in a, in a meeting. And afterwards I wrote it up as, hey, you didn't meet the standards of conduct to work with my team. My team is in high demand. These are the standards of conduct I have for the people on my team and also, coincidentally, anybody that works with my team. So if you want our support, these are the things I'm gonna expect from you. And it was just a really professional, clean, it wasn't about like, you said this and it really hurt my feelings. It wasn't like, I didn't make it emotional. I just said, hey, this is what I expect. You didn't meet those expectations. So moving forward, this is how we're gonna work together. And both of those moments, I kind of take learnings from those and I keep like replaying. It, it's once you do it once right or see someone next to you do it right, um, you'll, you'll be able to build on that and use those experiences. So even though it's uncomfortable, embrace those pivotal moments because the next one won't be as hard. It'll be a lot easier. Yeah, it can be so hard when you walk into a room and you feel like oh, you're being judged because of your age or because of how you look or because of your gender. And you start to feel like, well, do I belong here? Is any of this legit? The thing to remember is like, not only did you do all of your education and all your experience and do you have the skills, but you also overcame any of the biases that are in the room to be there. So like inherently, you probably deserve to be there more than anyone else because they didn't have to overcome all of those things just to convince people to let them into the room. Another thing I'll say is that like, it can be really hard at the beginning of your career to feel like, oh, can I always like stand up in a really big assertive way? It can't even be hard to recognize it. 
I don't know if you guys had the same experience where sometimes in the beginning of your career, you're like, I guess this is normal. I guess this is fine. Is this even a big problem? And then as you go forward, like you have this, this inherent responsibility to the community of other represented people to like learn better how to recognize any form of microaggression and then use your seniority as you work out through the ranks to speak out for the other people in situations that might not even recognize that that was a huge red flag that went by. Because it's like your, your inherent responsibilities, you move up, it becomes a little bit easier and also harder because you carry more of the burden of like recognizing and adjusting when things are not always appropriate. Yeah. It can be a hard space just to be real, or the other. Um, um, but for me, one of the, some of the things I have learned, uh, so when I started, I just kept worrying whether I was technical enough, right? Mm -hmm. There's this idea that you're never technical enough. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna start with like, no matter where you're at, start embracing that you're technical enough, especially in, in some of these spaces. Because there's this assumption every time that everyone's on the same page, First of all, every problem, people approach it from so many different angles, right? It doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> like it's, so the big part is like I, honing in on understanding the core concepts was what was important for me to start feeling comfortable in like who I am and what I bring. I don't need to know the specifics of how this tool is gonna be using it. It's just like I know how to ask the right questions. And not being afraid to ask why or how. You might be the only one uh, who does that for a while, and it feels even weirder, you know, if you're the only of already in a team of like, you know. And, um, but the reason I say that is communication, I have found has been one of the biggest challenges in a lot of these spaces. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, sadly to say, a lot of the times, the better communica communicators are the women on the team. Um, but the advantage of pushing the why is you get to be really good at knowing the bigger picture. And so you flip this idea of being only or one of a few to being the one who knows how to bring everything together. That's what I did for myself to make myself feel more and more comfortable in certain spaces. Um, I say all that because you, it depends on the culture. Some places are wonderful and it doesn't matter if you're the only, right? Like the only woman or the only young person or they'll be very supportive and you'll have cheerleaders. There are other places it's not like that. The reality is you have to understand the culture and all that stuff. But the big piece is more for you internally. It's like figuring out how do I want to show up and what can I consistently like, how do I consistently do that? Like building on what Amanda said. As, as, like she had the theater background where she knows how to, you know, like bring some lightness also to the room or it's just like figure out how you want to show up and then own that. And for me, it's more like I will be the communicator, but I will also know, always be able to zoom out and understand all the pieces of the puzzle. Um, so, yeah. Um, so de uh, defense is like Amanda, it can be true and, and Carrie, it can be a tricky one. Um, but I had an advisor, my thesis advisor in graduate school, speaking of mentor, he like still texts me, happy birthday. Shout out to Carl. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. Um, uh, he told me when I was, I don't know, I don't know why I did, when I was in undergrad, I felt very comfortable. And, and you know, the data science school seems like a nice, like you guys have a very comfortable, jovial, sort of camaraderie here. And um, that gave me a lot of confidence. And, and Carl, I remember one time told me in a meeting, after we'd had this big project review, he was like, you know how you always just say whatever you think and you don't really think about it? You just sort of say it? And I was like, yeah. And I thought he was gonna kind of like yell at me because I was like, <laughs> I, would, I probably did something stupid in a meeting. He was like, just always do that. No matter what, just always do that and you're gonna be just fine. And for whatever reason, I, I really took that to heart. Like, really took that to heart. And um, every time I, it just like pops in my head all the time. I'm just like, I don't know, this might cause some ripples, like, but I don't know. I just say whatever I think. And um, there's, I, I understand there's an inherent confidence required to do that, but 
uh, maybe practicing in this comfortable environment is a good way to stretch mm -hmm. that muscle. And I did that a lot in graduate school, and he was super supportive. So having somebody like that was probably also key. Um, and so saying what I think all the time, kind of for better or for worse. And then um, I ask all of what I think are the dumb questions all the time. It's a lot of listening and asking what I think are the dumb questions. Listening is the most powerful thing you can do in a meeting. The, the quietest person in the room is probably thinking the hardest. The talking person is just in transmit mode and uh, not really, they just have some agenda typically. So um, listening, asking the dumb questions, and then saying what you think tends to set you up for a situation where you can execute. Mm -hmm. And if you execute, it doesn't really matter whether you're a woman or a man. I'll actually say I was on a project with May, and she does that in real life. <laughs> and not only does it bring clarity to the project itself, it's this really beautiful side effect. It made me feel more confident yeah. because there was a woman in there asking a question. I'm like, thank God. I went, Where has she been? I've been wondering the same thing. And then, you know, I'm looking at this other lady. I'm like, yeah. This woman, she's got it. I'm so glad. <laughs> Thank God somebody, because I said that the other day and nobody wanted to, you know. So, you know, we have these whisper side conversations, but she was out in the front saying it authoritatively and you really empowered me and some other people. You might not have Props realized to Carl. that. But... <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for to Carl. Carl. <laughs> I love it. Just one more thing, and I know we're at time, but sometimes in the beginning, it can be so hard to say what you think in a huge group. That's right. So as an intermediate, like as you're getting prepared for this, if you find people in this big meeting that you're like, okay, I do trust these three people, try talking to them one-on-one -on -one after the fact and pulling up with them and saying, hey, these are the things that I think. Because not only will it help you because you'll have an ally that will start to look to you because you'll have already like had a more safe place to share out what you're thinking if it's too much to jump in for you, which, you know, mm -hmm. is huge kudos yeah. to the people who can do it, but sometimes it takes practice. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you to the audience for your wonderful questions. Thank you panelists for your answers. I'm wondering if we could just wrap up with each of you sharing just a few brief words of advice for those in the audience today. Oh, I'll go first. <laughs> Stay super curious. If you're in a place where you're not curious, think about leaving and like yeah. be courageous every single day because you're going to need it. No matter if you're at the start of your career or like 12 years in, doesn't matter. Curiosity and courage. For those uh, doing all the job screens, learn SQL. <laughs> 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 it seems so basic, but it's not. Um, every single data science job that I have had requires very strong SQL skills. And uh, reframe this idea of being technical enough. Um, focus on the concept versus the details. Always say what you think. Carl. <laughs> Carl's I love Carl. <laughs> Carl's great. <laughs> He's amazing. Um, aim to have fun. If you can find a job where you're having a good time, you will be excellent at it. And I've kind of used that to know when it's time for me to move on. And if you're not getting that, vote with your feet. Um, be confident enough to know that you're leaving says something about who you are and what you believe in, but also that there will be another opportunity for you. Um, yeah. Awesome. Can we just get a big round of applause for all of our panelists?